Hello, AP World History students. Welcome back to our final review session, 1750 to 1900. As a reminder, our your DBQ essays will end at 1900. So this is going to cover political revolutions, industrial revolution, and then finally imperialism. So please, once again, make sure you have those sheets printed out so you're ready to take notes as we're going through this. And as I mentioned today, uh, we're going to be doing political revolutions for this video. And I have to admit, those political revolutions is probably going to be my longest video that I end up writing, just because there's a lot of information we have to cover. Also, if you're looking at the relative importance of different units, I know College Board tends to weight these units a little bit he more heavy uh, than our previous units. Hence, I'm going to spend more time talking about them. So the for context, the first one I want to talk about is the Age of Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is a time frame when a bunch of different thinkers start thinking about what's the best form of government that helps the most people out. And for further context, th these writers, these philosophers, were thinking about these ideas during the age of absolutism, mostly in Europe, especially in France. And remember, the most important absolute monarch during this time period was Louis XIV, who got the guy who's called the Sun King, he, uh, you know, uh, to, made, created the Palace of Versailles. So you have these kings who are controlling everything, and they might have had legislative branches, but those legislative branches really don't do too much. So in this context of these guys, of these kings, ruling, you know, absolutely, you have these philosophers who come in who start thinking about a, maybe different ways on how kings should rule, or maybe even more provocatively, um, suggesting different forms of government that ne don't necessarily have the king in charge. Now, most of them wouldn't say they want democracies. Most of them would probably say we want limited monarchies. Maybe do you do have a legislative branch that does check the king, or maybe you want to do something like a constitution that puts in limits to a king. So one of the most important ideas that I want you guys to know is the social contract. So this idea was popularized by Rousseau. It was originally kind of came up with Thomas Hobbes, uh, but we're going to focus on Rousseau for our case. So the idea of the social contract is we give up some of our freedoms in exchange for the government to protect us. So the, uh, the, I guess the best example I can give you right now is what's currently being debated in the United States uh, during the pandemic. There's a lot of people who are arguing that the government's infringing against their freedom uh, because the government's saying you have to stay home, you're not allowed to go out in your businesses because you, know, you could die for it. So the government's saying you don't have that freedom. Now, other people say, yes, that's great, uh, we don't want to. You know, we want to limit those freedoms because if those people go out in the public, they could spread the pandemic, which could infringe on their freedom, you know, other people's freedom, uh, because then the pandemic spreads to people who didn't go out and then they die. So it's this constant conflict uh, where we want to give up some of our rights to the government for protection, as long as it's not too much. And one of the things that Rousseau adds a twist to the social contract: if the government takes away too much freedoms and then starts abusing those freedoms then the contract is null and void and we can start rebelling against them. And for the American Revolution, this is what we argue. The, the English government was so abusive in taking away our rights and abusing our rights that eventually that contract is null and void and we need to make a different contract with a different government. And therefore, it's, you know, I guess, philosophically valid uh, that we rebel against the English king. All right, the other big key phrase that I want you guys to know is natural rights. And this was done, uh, popularized by a guy named John Locke. I did not write him, write him down on here. Uh, but essentially, he came out, there's certain essential rights that no matter how you know, strong a king is or how powerful a government is, they can never take away from their citizens or subjects. And John Locke came up with life, liberty, and property. Those are things that governments can never take away from you. And of course, Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he made it life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think the joke was he took out the property just because, you know, we were trying to make a flourishing document that inspires people to rebel. You know, arguing for property doesn't sound as great as, you know, pursuit of happiness. Uh, but there you go. There's, these are certain rights that no matter what, the government will never take away with you and they shouldn't take away with you. And if they start taking away from you, then maybe that, you know, you can evolve into that social contract uh, where we're allowed to rebel. All right, so one of the most important revolutions besides the United States Revolution uh, was the French Revolution, which happens right after 
the American Revolution. So with this French Revolution, I'm just going to go through it really, really quickly. You have an absolute monarch. In this case, it was Louis XVI, I think is the grandson of Louis XIV. And essentially, France was having troubles when he was king. Uh, there was a famine going on. They were massively in debt. So it's just not a great situation. So much so that they, because they're massively in debt, uh, the king actually called in the legislative branch, which hadn't been in session for hundreds of years, to try to help him out to tax people. And during that time period, uh, only the third estate was the one actually paying taxes. You know, the third estate was basically the common French people, like 80, 90 percent of the actual people. The first estate and second estate were the nobility and the clergy. And those two states basically did not pay any taxes whatsoever. So during this estate's general meeting, uh, there was a vote going up there like, should we increase taxes, you know, maybe make the first and second estates actually pay taxes? And the result was no, we shouldn't do it because each estate had equal vote, even though the third estate made up the vast majority of the people. So eventually the third estate forms their own uh, legislative branch, the National Assembly, and the and the and the French Revolution really gets going. Originally, it was moderate and basically saying we maybe just want a limited monarchy with a more representative government, and eventually it gets more crazy and you know reign of terror and things like that. Uh, but during that moderate phrase, they produce a very important document, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is very you know, kind of tails uh, piggybacks on those previous things I talked about, especially those natural rights certain rights that no matter what the government can't take away from it. And a lot of it sounds very similar to what the Declaration of Independence was written about certain things that the government should not do. And I, I think I joke on this a little bit. I think Thomas Jefferson was the ambassador of France when this got written. And he'll always like to say he helped try to craft it. Although maybe he didn't help craft it, he certainly tried to help you know, bring the people together during this time period. And I would remind you, there is another famous document that I did not include on here, which was the Declaration of the Rights of Women, which was written, I think, a year or two after this declaration, which is essentially just a bunch of women who got together. It's like, I know this is all great about how men deserve right, but, you know, women, don't forget us, too. Um, so if you want to include that document in there when you're writing your essays, I, that'd be good as well. All right, so carrying on for the French Revolution, uh, you were, basically it started off as more of a conservative revolution. It became a super radical revolution that basically ate its founders uh, and like I said, with a reign of terror. And in this craziness that ends up happening, eventually a strong man, a general, takes over, and that is Napoleon. And like I said, one of the ironies of the French Revolution, they start off by rebelling against an absolute monarch, and they essentially end with an absolute monarch, with Napoleon in charge. And then Napoleon very famously takes over almost all of Europe. You can see this map right here. He either takes him over or he makes alliances with different kingdoms, with notably only really England not being invaded because they're an island. Um, Portugal, you can see it's independent. Uh, Napoleon didn't take him over, although I think with more time, Napoleon would have taken them over. Remember famously, Napoleon, uh, the, the Portuguese monarchs actually run away to Brazil for certain years and then leave Pedro uh, behind to rule as king. Um, but one of the big things that caused Napoleon's to fall apart was when he invades Russia. His army was not prepared for the winter, and eventually that's the turning point. The rest of Europe teams up on him, and over a series of years, they're able to conquer France and then depose uh, Napoleon, and he lives in exile the rest of his life. And then the Congress of Vienna, the other big term you want to know, was essentially all those leaders, they get together in a room, and they decide how they're going to reshape Europe, how that basically Napoleon's destroyed Europe when he conquered it all. So some of those things in that meeting that happened is they ignored nationalism. So the idea that, you know, we are French, therefore this, we are Germans, we are, therefore we should form a nation. They tried to ignore those urges. So one of the things that happens is if you look at the middle where Germany is, you can see it's eventually going to become the Confederation of the Rhine. or you know, That's not going to be a bunch of small countries. They're not going to actually make a Germany. And then eventually, you know, later on, someone like Audubon Bismarck is going to use nationalism to build up. But for now, they're going to ignore it. Like even Italy does not exist yet after the Congress of Vienna. It's not until later on that Italy becomes Italy. Um, the other big key thing I want you guys to remember from the Congress of Vienna is the balance of power, quote unquote. And one of the things the leaders took from Napoleon was that balance of power got you know, out of whack. One country became way too powerful. So they started making certain alliances that happened uh, between different countries, just trying to balance it out so no one power becomes too strong. And therefore, you'd have another Napoleon who takes over the rest of the Europe. And this balance of power thing relatively works for about 100 years. We have no major wars. But then ultimately, it fails about 100 years later with you know, World War I. Those alliances end up collapsing on each other, and you have one big global war. All right, so jumping ahead, uh, jumping a little bit to the South American side of things, 
is those high ideals of enlightenment, and especially during the French Revolution about all men being created equal, well, they, there was a certain French colony, Saint-Domingue, present-day Haiti, who are reading a lot of those documents and saying, you know what, yeah, all, you know, this revolutionary fervor should matter to us as well. And eventually there is there was a slave rebellion there. It's the only successful slave rebellion in Haiti. And it was led by a former slave himself, Toussaint Louverture. And they eventually do win their freedom. They fight against English armies, Spanish armies, and French armies. And every single time, the, the, these former slave armies were able to be victorious. Not necessarily because they won a lot of battles, but mainly because when those European armies showed up, uh, a lot of them, you know, logistically diseased and whatnot, ended up dying. And, you know, argumentatively, you know, the Louisiana Purchase, where Thomas Jefferson bought, you know, like half the United States from the French, one of the reasons why the French gave up all that territory was because their armies suffered massive defeat in Haiti, and they just couldn't handle, you know, that the rest of the territory. So they're like, we'll just sell it to the United States, you know, and cut our losses. Plus, he was, you know, too busy also conquering Europe during that time period. All right, the next big leader I want you guys to know is Simone Boulevard. So he was a Creole, or a Creole is a mix of Europe, person of a Euro, uh, European descent, but he's actually born in the United States, or not United States, in the Americas. And he was reading all these alignments. He's like, yeah, we need to get off this yoke of colonialism rule, and we should form our own version of the United New South America. You know, that's what he wanted. Now, most of these colonies in South America are Spanish colonies. The one that was not a Spanish colony is, is Brazil. They're Portuguese. And Portugal, you know, eventually is going to have their own little thing where, the, you know, Pedro takes over. And he was eventually successful in, in fermenting, you know, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Venezuela, all do get their independence. However, they do not actually unify. They all end up being separate countries. However, a lot of South America do, does see Simone Bolivar as their symbolic George Washington. And especially in northern South America is where he did a lot of his things. All right, and then back in nationalism real quick. Uh, the other thing that the French Revolution started to unleash is this idea of nationalism. Like, we are all French, therefore we need to unify together. And eventually we're all Germans, therefore we need to unify all together. Therefore we're Italian, we need to unify all together. And as a reminder again, during the... Uh, Congress of Vienna, they tried to ignore this nationalism, but for the decades afterwards, nationalism kept on growing and growing and growing. So, yeah, I always say, don't actually write this on the DBQ essay. I try to fancy it up with more academic languages, but it's essentially super patriotism. The idea that you devote yourself to your country to the point when you're really, you know, you're just going to serve your country's self-interest, even if it requires, you know, hurting other countries or, you know, attacking other countries. And I mentioned here it could either unify or divide empires. So it's going to unify countries like Germany and Italy. And for one empire in particular, or I can make another, another one, it divides them. That would be the Austrian Empire, which you can kind of see in the background there. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire was big and massive, and it was more of a traditional empire where you have different nationalities kind of get meshed together under one rule. And traditionally that worked really well for most of uh, world history. But with the advent of nationalism, Austria starts breaking apart. And eventually, World War I, it's when they, they, it just blows up and they have a bunch of smaller countries that you know, diverge from it. Um, the other empire, traditional empire, that eventually dies during World War I is the Ottoman Empire. And it's a similar thing. Different nationalities start chipping away at the Ottoman Empire because they'd rather be their own thing. Like Egypt in particular, the Ottoman Empire, uh, just wanted to be their own thing. All right, one big important leader that I want you guys to know for the German Empire was Otto von Bismarck. Uh, he was the prime minister for the Prussian Empire, who eventually, through a series of wars, is able to unify uh, the lesser German states to join Prussia and then form a new empire, the German Empire. And like I said, he argued that we all have one German identity, therefore we should uh, unify together on that. And especially those lesser German states initially were hesitant to do it. Uh, especially because they didn't want to be overshadowed by their northern neighbors. Um, also because a lot of the Austrian Empire, especially you can see if you look at this map right here, that German Confederation does have a lot of Austria in there as well. And during the Congress of Vienna, if you look, Vienna is the capital of Austria, uh, Austria wanted to keep that the German states weak with them being more in charge, not Prussia in charge. So over those series of decades after the Congress of Vienna, there was like a power struggle between those two empires, with Prussia eventually gaining the upper hand. And one of the, probably the most important war that eventually unifies all those German states together is the Franco-Prussian War, where Bismarck provokes war with France, which builds up a nationalism fervor going on there and puts all those countries together. And once they defeat France, 
uh, that's eventually the birth of uh, Germany, which I believe was in 1871, I think, something in that time frame. They eventually become a German empire. And the other big nationalist leader that I want you guys to know is Giuseppe Garibaldi. And he's the one that I give that he's not the only one, but he's the he's the one I give credit for unifying Italy. So he was a leader of a militia group, the Red Shirts, famously because you know they wear red shirts, so if they get cut, uh, you won't actually see them bleeding. And he invades southern Italy and then gives southern Italy to uh, Victor Emmanuel, who becomes king of a unified Italy. And that political cartoon is a very famous political cartoon where yeah, he, he unifies the boot and then gives the boot to his emperor so that they are finally unified. And that happens and also, I think, in the 1870s. All right, so that's it for the political revolutions. I know that was really fast. Um, so please stay tuned for our next one, which is going to be our industrial revolutions.